Uh, hi, you can go ahead and pray. Okay. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We give you all the glory and all the honor for this um, session. Father, we thank you for all what we have been able to to teach us, Father, through our instructor, through our teacher. We thank you, Father, for the journey so far. We even commit this session into your hands, and we trust, O oh Lord, that you grant us understanding. We ask all this in the name of your precious Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Uh, are you all able to hear? Okay? No? Can we raise the volume a bit? I think the fans are very loud. So. Okay, thank you. So uh, just to repeat for the e-learning students as well, today will be our last class for interpreting scripture. Um, so we're going to just be looking at the last few questions that are in your textbook uh, from page 44 onward. And I think we should be able to cover all of them today. OK, so uh, let's go into the first one. Is water baptism necessary for salvation? Um, so uh, there are some people who view it as necessary. But uh, when we look at scripture, we know that there were people who were saved and then uh, baptized, right? Um, and so we understand that water baptism is an expression of our faith in Christ. And it is our faith in Christ that uh, is gives us the hope of eternal life. It's not water baptism, not that act of water baptism, rather our faith in Christ. So uh, while baptism is something that is um, instituted in the church in the New Testament and is something that we continue to follow, we recognize that there may be instances where someone has not been baptized for one reason or another, uh, where they've come to faith, but they haven't been baptized. Um, and they may uh, die before they are baptized. But in that case, we believe that they will still be saved. That is, they will still um, be welcomed into God's presence uh, based on the fact that they believed in Christ uh, because water baptism is not the necessity, not the necessary requirement for entering uh, into heaven or entering into eternal life. Okay. Um, so that is, is water baptism necessary for salvation? Uh, the next question is, if you all have any questions in between, feel free to raise your hands or, uh, yeah, just unmute and you all can ask your questions. Um, the next is, can a believer depart from Christ and lose his salvation? Again, here we see there is a large part of uh, the church at large that believes that once you're saved, you are saved uh, for eternity. There's no way that you can lose your salvation. Uh, but we have here uh, many, many scriptures listed. We'll just go through them. Uh, we may not be able to open and read all of them, um, but we'll just look at what are each of these scriptures talking about and why we believe that it is possible for a believer to go away, to stray away from the faith. And by straying away from the faith, they lose their salvation. Okay, so um, Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 uh, talks about people who have been saved, who've experienced the grace of God, and then they have gone away from God. And uh, for such people, uh, there is no more chance for repentance because they have treated uh, Christ's sacrifice lightly. They've trampled on the blood of Christ. Uh, and so uh, this uh, this is one of the verses. Another is Hebrews 10, 26 to 39. Um, it talks about if we keep sinning after we know the truth, there is no sacrifice for sins left. So one is straying away, like turning away from the faith. The other is continuing in sin. Um, then 1 John 5, 16, uh, this talks about um, 
not even praying for someone who has uh, sinned unto death. And so this is talking about denying Christ. Uh, the whole of 1 John talks about uh, heresy that had come into the church, specifically to do with uh, whether Christ is the Messiah, whether Christ is the Son of God. And so uh, here he's saying if someone is denying Christ, then he's denying uh, not only Christ, he's also denying the Father. And so uh, for such people, uh, there is no hope of salvation. Um, 1 Timothy, we have a few verses listed here talking about people who've strayed away from the faith. Um, Romans 8, 5 to 13, a believer who lives according to the flesh will die. Uh, 1 John 2 and 3, uh, here, John uh, says that loving people and living in holiness is a necessity for believers. So if you are not, if you don't love your brothers and sisters, if you are continuing in sin, uh, then there will be judgment for you. Um, 1 Corinthians 9, 2 Corinthians 13, Paul talks about watching over himself. So he talks about how he is... Uh, he is being faithful to pass on the faith to others, but he also talks about watching over and keeping guard over himself so that he himself won't be disqualified uh, when Christ comes, when Christ judges us. So uh, just by talking about that, he's saying there is a possibility of disqualification. Uh, so it's important that we guard ourselves against falling away from the faith or falling into sin. Um, Galatians 5, 16 and 19 to 21 talks about practicing the works of the flesh that such people can't inherit the kingdom of God. Um, then uh, 1 Timothy 4 talks about believers who can be deceived and who depart from the faith. Uh, 2 Peter 2 says it's better to have never known uh, the way of righteousness than to uh, to come to faith and turn away. Because if you've done that, it uh, compares it to a dog returning to its vomit. Uh, it's like that. Uh, Matthew 10, 22, uh, if we endure, uh, if we do not endure to the end, uh, what happens? So if we endure, we will be saved, is what Matthew 10 says. Um, but if we do not endure, that automatically means we will not be saved, according to that verse. Um, Exodus 32, Revelation 3 talks about names being blotted out of the book of life. Uh, Ephesians 2, James 2, it says uh, that faith must produce works. So uh, our works prove what our faith is. So automatically, if we are not producing works that are in line with God's righteousness, with God's will for our lives. That is evidence of a lack of faith. And then uh, Romans 6 and Hebrews 6, can a free gift once received be rejected or discarded or lost? And the answer is yes. Okay, whenever there's a gift given to us, we have the freedom to choose whether we will receive it or whether we will reject it. Uh, so there is a possibility that we reject this gift that we have received. Um, so those are all the reasons, as per scripture, uh, why we stand on the side of it's possible for someone who was once a believer to then turn away from God and lose their salvation. Um, but we do recognize that there are um, a lot of churches that uh, say, the, say the opposite. Okay, um, is everything that happens the will of God? Uh, so uh, we believe that, again, there are uh, people who stand on both sides, uh, but uh, our standing is that we all have been blessed with free will. Uh, so we see that right from Genesis, uh, where Adam and Eve are given the freedom to choose whether they will obey God or not. Okay, and based on their choice, is what uh, is the result of what they uh, choose, that they are separated from God. OK, and we also see in the Old Testament um, where 
uh, where the law is presented to the Israelites, it says, choose blessing or curse, choose life or death. OK, so Joshua uh, says this, but as for me and my house, uh, we will serve the Lord, right? So there's always that choice that's given to humanity. And um, based on what we choose will be the result. So whether it is with salvation or our everyday choices, uh, God gives us the freedom to choose. Now, in spite of our choices, God works out his overall plans and purposes. So God has an overall plan and purpose that he has in mind. Right, His plans are not going to be changed based on the decisions that we make. He will work those plans out uh, that are separate from what choices we make. OK, so that's our standing. Um, there is a question on chat. Um, what if a believer has gone away from Jesus because of depression or a tough situation? And in the end, they died without peace and joy of Christ. Will they go to heaven or not? Um, so uh, with, when it comes to judgment, it definitely we leave it to God to make that decision. Uh, because God knows, uh, see, if we're talking about depression, it is a mental illness. And it's something that that person didn't have uh control over i don't like if they're getting medical help those kinds of things um so there are people who commit suicide who go into depression commit suicide um they may have been believers even uh but it's but they did that in that moment so that's a different thing uh, but if they've rejected god gone back into a life of sin uh then God, uh, God will judge that sin. So it depends ex on the situation and what exactly happened. Yeah, that can, okay. Um, okay, so should a believer tithe? Okay, so we have a list of verses here. If we look at the first two, Abraham and Jacob, uh, both of them, uh, the, these instances of them tithing was before the law was instituted. So there was no law given uh, to Moses at this time. So Abraham and Jacob. So Jacob says, if you bless me, I will give you a tenth of everything I get. And Abraham, we know, gives a tenth after his uh, victory in battle. He gives a tenth to Melchizedek. Uh, it's only in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Malachi, these examples that are given here, only there that it becomes a part of the law that's given to Moses. Um, in the New Testament, so we talked about this in interpreting scripture, right? If something is not taken away or said, you should not follow this anymore, then we continue to follow it. So there's no place in the New Testament that says we should not tithe anymore. Although it says we're free from the law, since this is something that was there before the law, we can see tithe as a practice before the law. Uh, we understand that it's not something that we should stop doing. And also we see Matthew 23, 23 and Hebrews 7, 1 to 10 examples of tithing continues. So let's just check, uh, read those two verses, Matthew 23, 23 and Hebrews 7, 1 to 10. Matthew 23, verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weather matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Okay, so we see here Matthew 28. 23, 23, Jesus is not saying you don't have to tithe, you only have to show mercy uh, and justice. Uh, he's saying show mercy, show justice, along with following the other parts of tithing uh, as well. Okay, And then Hebrews 7, 1 to 10.
Hebrews 7 verses 1 to 10. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continu continually. From verse 4, now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham, but he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here, mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Thank you. So here we see um, Melchizedek being presented as a uh, type of Christ, right? And so uh, the same practice of uh, tithing uh, that was seen where Abraham tithes to Melchizedek, uh, we continue to practice. And here the reasons for tithing are given. It is to be given uh, for the work of uh, the priesthood, right? So it's given to the Levites. Uh, it is given to the priests to carry on their work of ministry. And it was also in the Old Testament, when we look at it, uh, used as a form of worship. So because it was used in these ways, uh, the verses are given here in your notes, Numbers 18, 28, and Nehemiah 10, 37 to 38, uh, as an expression of worship and to support the ministry of the, uh, of the temple. Uh, we continue to do that because we continue to show our worship of Christ through the giving of uh, the gifts that he's given us financially and materially and also we continue to support the work of the ministry as well um we go to the next question saul and the witch of endor so uh this is in first samuel 28 1 to 20. uh we see here that saul has um been he he sinned against god and now no longer is the chosen one of god to serve him as king and uh, he's in this place of not having god's wisdom and so he goes to a medium to find out whether he's going to win a battle that they're going to enter into and he asked this uh which uh to bring up the spirit of Samuel. So the question is, does the witch actually bring up the spirit of Samuel? Or is it a demonic spirit, an evil spirit that is impersonating Samuel? So our standing is that uh, this is not the explained in scripture. There is no uh, clear answer to it from scripture itself uh, but just the fact that a medium or uh, someone who is a witch uh, cannot have access to uh, to the spirits of people like holy people uh, so we look at it as a demonic spirit or an evil spirit who is impersonating the spirit of samuel Okay, because uh, Samuel was dead, and uh, from what we read, um, we know that he was in the bosom of Abraham, right? So the witch would not have access to his spirit. Um, and so our standing is that this was an evil spirit. Uh, however, there isn't a clear answer in scripture for this. Uh, drinking alcohol. Okay, um, so here in scripture we see uh, let's just turn maybe to one of these passages we look at galatians 5 19 to 21. someone can read that for us 
Galatians. 19 to 21, sister? Yes, 5, 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lividness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, rivalries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Thank you. Uh, so we see uh, in this example from Galatians 5.21, drunkenness mentioned. And if we look at other examples in scripture, it's usually talking about drunkenness. It's not talking about drinking small quantities of wine. Uh, so uh, there are people that are even church leaders uh, in some cultures who will drink um, as a part of their culture or who will drink a little socially uh, and it's acceptable because it's not really talked about in scripture as a sin if you drink a little. Uh, the sin is if you get drunk. Um, so that is the difference. What is a sin and what is not a sin? Uh, on the other hand, our stand as a church uh, is to avoid it completely because you uh, can very easily fall into the onto the side of being drunk at some point, right? Uh, so to draw that line, you are yourself kind of playing with that line uh, where you may at some point cross over. So it's better to stay away from it completely from that uh, regard. And also, uh, if we look at 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 10, it talks about doing things that are really beneficial. So is this really beneficial? Is something that is really required? Uh, if not, then it's better to avoid it completely. Um, another example that I can share is from uh, Romans where... Um, is it from Romans, where Paul is talking about how he has sacrificed his rights for the sake of uh, those who are weaker in faith, right? And he says, if I do anything that will cause someone else to stumble, uh, then I will be judged for it. So um, that is another reason that I'm just adding to what is already here in your notes. It's better not to indulge in drinking because there is somebody else that is watching you who might be influenced by you and who may not have the same kind of control uh, that you have and so you might be causing a weaker person to stumble a weaker person in faith uh, a person who is more likely to go all the way and get drunk uh, because they have seen your example and especially if you're in a place of leadership and influence uh, so in that case also it's much much better to Avoid it completely. Um, clothing and attire. Uh, we'll read these two passages: First Timothy two eight to ten, and First Peter three three to five. If, uh, someone can read those for us. First Timothy 2, 9 and 10, sister. Uh, yeah, in 2, 8 to 10. 2, 8 to 10. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with pro propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Thank you. And uh, First Peter 3, 3 to 5. Uh, First Peter 3, 3 to 5. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Uh, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart 
with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of god thank you uh you can go on till verse 5 okay sister for in this manner in former times the holy women who trusted in god also adorned themselves being submissive to their own husband as sarah obeyed abraham calling him lord whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror okay so um there are some people who believe that you shouldn't wear any women should not wear any jewelry or any makeup um and sometimes these verses are used in support of that view um but if we look here um it's saying uh in second uh, timothy 29 uh don't dress yourselves uh dress yourselves modestly with propriety and moderation so don't be consumed with dressing up okay uh, and then first peter 3 5 says let it not be a merely outward thing so merely outward means don't be so focused on what is on the outside that you ignore what is on the inside so uh, it's important that the heart condition is the focus and what you do on the outside becomes not as important is not something that you are focusing on but if we look at the old testament we can see that uh, there are examples here genesis 24 22 and 53 this is where um isaac meets uh his wife and he carries gifts isaac and rebecca and he carries gifts for her and it's all jewelry so we know that they were wearing jewelry so even though in these new testament examples in first peter he's talking about these women from the old testament he's not talking about the fact that they didn't wear jewelry he's talking about the attitude of their hearts uh, so in the same way we uh, say focus on your inner person and allow your clothes and all of that to become of less important focus it doesn't mean you shouldn't wear jewelry you shouldn't dress up uh that's not the point of the verses the point of the verses focus on the heart okay um and that rule becomes equally important for the people on the other side who are judging outward appearances that they shouldn't be judging what they're seeing on the outside uh what is important is what is in the person's heart okay um with that we also encourage modesty and um yeah dressing up in a way that is appropriate uh so we have i think the last two questions anything anyone wants to bring up based on what we've discussed so far okay then we'll just uh, go to the last two questions uh, tattoos and then the sabbath so um, in the old testament we see here leviticus 1928 says you shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead nor tattoo any marks on you i am the lord uh, now when it's talking about cuttings it's talking about self harm or self mutilation um so it's uh talking about things that were used in worship of uh idols so usually these kinds of things were done in uh in times when they were worshiping idols or when they were mourning for their dead uh so in that case uh or in because of that was the cultural practice god is saying don't follow the practices of these people because this is what it is linked to uh in present day we don't see tattoos the same way uh it's not done as a form of worship in fact there are many believers who uh use tattoos to kind of profess their faith 
in Christ. And so uh, we don't judge and say, because they've done this, they're going to hell or they have sinned. Uh, because here, when we see this rule of don't place a tattoo on your body, it is linked to what was the cultural practice of that day, which doesn't exist today. Um, so that would be the general gist of our standing is it doesn't stand for worship of other gods in our present day. And so someone may choose to do it. Uh, and if they choose to do so, we don't judge them as people who are sinners or people who are going to go to hell for what they have done. OK, um, any questions? OK, uh, and then we go to the last one, Sabbath. Uh, why don't we observe Saturday as the Sabbath? OK, so we see in the Old Testament that that was a very strict part of the law and actually began to be emphasized more and more by the Pharisees, which is why in the New Testament they are so against Jesus uh, for, in their view, he's breaking the Sabbath when he's healing people. Uh, because the Sabbath became something that was really, really emphasized in uh, by some of the Jewish leaders and among the Pharisees. But in the New Testament, we see that people started meeting, the church started gathering on the Lord's Day, which was the was Sunday when Jesus was resurrected. So we continue to practice that uh, in the church today, but we don't emphasize that every church must meet on a Sunday, and that is the only day uh, we can worship as a church because we recognize that there are parts of the world where it is not possible. Uh, in some parts of the world, Sunday is a working day, and so the church meets on another day. Um, we see here in Romans 14, 4 to 8, uh, if someone can read that for us, we'll just read that passage. Romans 14, 4 to 8. Romans chapter 14, verses, verse 4. Who are you to judge another servant to his own master? He stands or, for, or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Verse 5. One person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. Verse 6. He who observes the day, observe it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats the Lord, for he gives God, gives God thanks. And he who does not e eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. Verse 7, for none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. Verse 8, for if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. OK, so here we see um, Paul addressing this issue of some people considering some days more holy than other days. Some people consider all days holy. Uh, so we likewise take that stand that all days are holy, whether we live uh, or whether we die, whatever it is, everything is as, as unto the Lord. And so um, so whether we choose to worship on a Saturday or a Sunday or any other day, uh, the point is that we are worshiping the Lord, uh, that we are gathering as believers, uh, and that we are continuing to fellowship, continuing uh, to do the works of the church. So that's the um that's the reason why we don't focus on sabbaths being on the saturday um because in the new testament clearly we see that that is changed okay so like we talked about if we see something from the old testament that is clearly um removed in the in the new testament then we will follow whatever the new testament or later revelation has taught about it um, there's a question here. What about marriage rituals, which were followed by our forefathers like Torings? Um, 
so um, uh, Sister Lucy has mentioned, uh, has asked this question. Uh, I think, uh, Sister, the main thing is what is the significance of these things? Um, like we see in uh, that Old Testament, like uh, we talked about the example of Isaac and Rebecca, there was the practice of in getting married that he, they gifted all of this gold, all of this jewelry to the bride. And that was something that was done that was not in any way considered as wrong um, or something that God said should not be followed. Uh, so in the same way, we uh, look at that in our context as well. Uh, if jewelry is a way of celebrating that covenant that we are entering into, then it's absolutely fine uh, to, to express, to wear those things, to show that we are married. Right. So um, like we read in First Corinthians as well, the practice of covering their head. So it was a practice in that culture that that's how they showed that they were married. So in our culture, if it is you wear toe rings to show that you are married, then it's completely fine to follow the culture uh, to be able to express uh, whatever you need to express through that uh, as it, there's no rule against it in scripture. Is that yes, sister? Uh, what about uh, they do this uh, in bride making about applying turmeric? Those things can we participate in such things? Alti, uh, alti, they say, right? Applying turmeric before the wedding day, yeah, is it? yeah, before the wedding day. And all. Yeah, all of those things. I think um, it. Um, my understanding of it is it's just a way of preparing the bride for the or even the bridegroom. Uh, for the wedding day, right? It's a process of beautification of the family gathering and celebrating and um, being part of what is going to happen on the day of the wedding. So there's nothing uh, that is related to worship of some other god or uh, turning away from our own faith. Uh, so there's no reason why we shouldn't practice it. Yes, yes. Because some communities they are against uh, doing all such things, they feel it's something like a open doors for something. Uh, some they uh, they are against it because it's some oh, like opening doors for the evil things. Okay, yeah, I don't see it that way because it's not related to worship of any god, right? Unless unless it has been dedicated or so. Yeah, the whole thing is just more of a process of beautification. Then we should say that we cannot go to beauty salons, we cannot cut our hair, we cannot uh, do any of those things. We shouldn't shave, we shouldn't... All of these things are ways of us just uh, taking care of our own bodies, uh, taking care of the things that God has given us. And there are special things done in relation to getting married so that turmeric uh, the practice of that is related to the wedding day um, it's not related to worship in any way of any other god so um, i wouldn't say that there's anything wrong with it okay sister thank you thank you uh indel you can go ahead yes Okay, Mama, I have um, actually I have three questions, so I'm okay, just going sure. to. Ask. Okay, so my first question, the first question is um, um, during the Christian Leaders Conference, Pastor Ashish and, and the other pastors actually taught us about creating a mentoring culture within a local church, a local church assembly. So the the emphasis was actually on spiritual mentoring. But now there is something I'd like to know. When we talk of spiritual mentoring, is it like um, a scheme of work? Is it, um, do we like have a body of truth which you can actually teach maybe a person, a believer or someone who just accepted Christ and now you have to work the journey with him until he becomes a disciple? I mean, is there, okay. a, is there a particular body of truth? Like how do we do discipleship? That's like, how do we mentor? Okay. How do we sorry, mentor? sorry, Indel, you're really soft. Uh, are you all able to hear the, it's not uh, something on your side. It's, I think, our uh, sound here. Um, 
We'll just see if we can raise the volume. Okay. Can you try again? Sorry, Inder. Okay. Yes, my, my question is, how do we go about discipling or mentoring people? That's for a person who just accepts Christ today. How do you walk the journey with him to see that the person matures into a disciple? I mean, do we have a body of truth? Like maybe, okay, teaching, like what are the teaching? What are the, the, the practical steps? Like how, how do you go about mentoring or discipling a, a convert or a new believer? Like how do you do it like practically? Um, so, uh, actually, I think while we were doing the, in our other class, the New Testament survey, we saw that Mark, uh, the book of Mark actually had some really good um, practices that um, we can adopt in our churches for discipleship. Uh, one of the major things is having a mentor uh, who is committed to mentoring the new believer. So having one person who uh, is investing, who is following up, uh, who is guiding that new believer. Um, the second thing is also having uh, what's helpful from a church perspective is having a set of teachings that you want to pass on to new believers. So that is something that we do as a church. Uh, when someone comes to faith, they receive um, a package with uh, different uh, basics of the Christian faith. And so um, there is someone who can go through that with them if they choose to do that with a mentor. Uh, so that's another thing, having um, and these resources, like we have uh, the foundations book on our website, which is for new believers. Um, having something like that, that you can go through with uh, the new believer, just on the basics of the Christian faith. Uh, that is another thing uh, that you can do. Um, the other thing would be just to meet regularly with the person, uh, to meet with them, answer their questions, uh, help them through things that they are struggling with. Uh, if they uh, have any personal struggles, uh, being able to pray with them, being able to encourage them. Uh, so having just that kind of relationship, but also then um, connecting them to the body of believers. So the mentor plays a very important role. But if we look at how Jesus discipled his 12, it wasn't just Jesus and the disciple, right? It was the 12 disciples with Jesus. So there was that relationship that they shared with each other and the relationship that they shared with Jesus himself. Um, so having that as well, where they are connected to the rest of the body. So they're uh, coming for the worship services. They uh, are part of some kind of cell group uh, where they are growing with other believers and have other people also speaking into their lives. Um, those are uh, three things. And then also teaching them to be able to, st to study the Bible, to pray by themselves uh, so that they are uh, spending that time by themselves growing in faith as well. Um, does that answer your question? Okay, it does okay. now. Okay, second okay. question. Okay, my second question is um, for those who are called like the Christian ministry, um, you know that okay, you have to you have to begin a new work, but now you don't have the finances to actually get a church a church running. Like you don't have the finances to maybe rent um, a, a building and get started so how do you go like what does what are the alternatives what actually can you do in such a situation okay um one way uh, so it depends on uh, what you sense god is calling you to do has he called you to completely give up your present work and uh, only focus on the ministry if that is the case um, then it would be to start small. So don't immediately look at, we need to have a church building, we need to have all of this stuff. Uh, we, what can you do that is uh, free and easily accessible? Can you use somebody's house? Um, so we see in the New Testament that that was the practice, right? Somebody, they were meeting in people's houses. Uh, so doing things like that, that won't require um, won't require a lot of finances. If you um, 
feel that okay there isn't that kind of um you don't feel that god has said give up your work completely then look at possibilities of starting your ministry alongside your work and then slowly transitioning to full time ministry and uh, giving up your work if you feel at some point that okay now is the time to make that full switch uh, because like you said you may not have uh, you may not have people tithing you may not have people uh, supporting the work right from the start and so you have to also be practical and look at what is the possibility of doing this without getting to a point where you and your family uh, are not able to continue the work because of a lack of finances thank you very much ma'am and now the last question is um okay. and there's this um this approach which i um we are trying to like when it comes to evangelism because we have this always we have just this one particular way of we um, of evangelizing now um, i'm from cameroon cameroon actually it's um it's a very diversified nation we have muslims and we have christians so now what is the approach like what kind of approach can we adopt to evangelize or to actually witness to a muslim because some of them they really play very tough they are very very tough you it's difficult for you to to walk up to them and actually engage them in a conversation because they are very very close so i don't know if you can like maybe give a tip or some an advice okay uh, my first advice would be to start with a lot of prayer um, so our uh, contexts uh, can be so different right so i could be ministering to muslims in india uh, which would look completely different from uh, the context that you are ministering to although you're still ministering to muslims uh, in cameroon so uh, really it has to be god uh, opening doors uh, god giving you divine strategies um, for the context that you're in um, them may not be a step like one to three steps you can follow um, and it's all going to work uh, so definitely the first thing is start with prayer uh, the second is uh, look at uh, what it is what are the questions that people are asking and what is um, what would be an effective open door to start to have conversations about faith uh, is it like we see in the in the new testament that preaching on the streets or um, just going to the marketplace was something that they could do it may not be so in our context uh, so what uh, are other ways that we can uh, have these conversations is it in the context of friendships is there uh, places that uh, we can find where we can start having conversations of faith how can we build relationships with people um, uh, we do a lot of um, this is like with police permission uh, here where we can go distribute things on the street uh, so if that is a possibility distributing pamphlets distributing free books um, and then in in the process of doing that starting conversations with people uh, so looking at what is uh, possible what is allowed in your uh, context what would uh, enable you to have these conversations um, and then trying trying them out um, but it has to like be grounded in prayer uh, starting with prayer and continuing with prayer uh, throughout really relying on god to give us um, strategies for how to do it in our context okay. thank you so much ma'am. thank you um okay so we I've come to the end of our class. If you had any questions that you needed to ask that maybe we didn't address, um, please feel free to post on Google Classroom and we can have it there. And for e-learning students, you can post on the e-learning platform. I know that, uh, that you all have been doing that. 
Um, I also needed to still post. I, I had mentioned that I would post something on Google Classroom uh, regarding one of the questions that we talked about last week. Um, so I'll do that today. Um, also, I, I will try and post this exam for this class this week um, as soon as possible so that you all can finish it off and then focus on New Testament survey next week. Uh, so just be on the lookout. I'll um, I'll post it as soon as I can sometime this week and maybe give you all till the end of next Monday uh, to finish it. Okay. Thank you all. It's been a good semester with you all. Uh, God bless you and have a good uh, break. We'll come back for New Testament survey after this. Thank you, sister. Thank you.